Tara, hi, welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Thanks for having me, super stoked to be here. I'm excited to dig into your incredible journey that seemingly you've done in a really short amount of time. For anyone who might not know who you are yet, could you give us a bit of an introduction to who you are and what your business is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So yeah, my name is Tara. I am based in Vancouver, BC, up in Canada. And my company is Smart Sweets, where we are on a mission to kick sugar, keep candy, and become the global leader in revolutionizing candy. My gosh, and you're absolutely crushing it, crushing those that vision. I want to go back to the very beginning, to what your life was like before you started the brand and what was getting you interested in starting a candy company in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. So I always had ideas growing up. You know, I was always watching Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and always ideating, writing my ideas down, but I didn't have the confidence to think that I could actually be capable of acting on an idea and making it successful. And that didn't happen until I was in university when I um, developed a healthier relationship with food and then a healthier relationship with myself because of that. And I had this confidence and belief in myself that I hadn't had before. Um, And so in university, I didn't know what I was doing, wasn't passionate about anything, was just floating along, I feel like, as so many people are just trying to figure it out. (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) And I ended up starting my first startup, which was called Deckled Out, and it was a vinyl um, and chalkboard wall decal idea, basically for students and home renters who couldn't damage their walls. So that was a huge learning lesson. Uh, It had so many lessons in it, failed miserably, but it wasn't miserable at all because it gave me the stepping stones of golden nuggets of knowledge that allowed me to apply it to my next idea, Smart Sweets, and made just such a huge, huge difference in how I approached it. Was there kind of like a light bulb moment for you when you were like, oh, I'm actually going to start a candy brand now? Like, this is going to be the next idea? Was there something that you kind of pinpoint as the very beginning? Yeah, so I was always a candy addict growing up. It was, it was like a day without candy was, it it didn't exist for me. I was having it all the time and found so much joy in it. And then I stopped eating it because of all the excess sugar and how that was making me feel. Um, So when I was, older in university, I had a conversation with my grandmother who also loved candy and we enjoyed it so much together. And she had shared with me that she regretted having so much excess sugar throughout her life because of how it made her feel. So that was the moment for me where I paused and I was like, wait, you can go your whole life feeling bad about yourself because of what you're putting in your body why can't we feel good about candy? So that was really uh, what sparked the idea. And then from there, I just went, dove in into just taking step by step each day, not knowing what I was doing, but buying the gummy bear mold, buying the ingredients, Googling and stalking LinkedIn's of people who had successfully built um, businesses that I now was aspiring to try and figure out to build myself. So yeah, that's what sparked it. So were you like in your kitchen at home making recipes to see what was good and like trial and error? That's how it started. Yeah, I was literally in my basement suite, like the like classic basement suite, just like super dark, not very, very many windows or much light. And I was just in there recipe testing all day long. Um, and just Googling food science journals. And I'm pretty sure I Googled at one point how to start a successful food company. Like I knew nothing and I'm trying to find as much information I could to take the next step forward each day. How many like iterations or, you know, trial and errors do you think that you did? And how long did it take you until you landed on the product that you launched with? Yeah, 
hundreds for sure. It was, I was in my kitchen all summer long. I had found an accelerator, like incubator type program for young entrepreneurs. And it was primarily tech focused. And so I thought, you know what, like there's no way I'm getting into this, but I'm going to try because if you don't try, then you just don't know. And then got accepted into that. And that was at the end of the summer as my recipe was nearing completion. So it gave me a kind of office space environment to grind from each day surrounded by other young um, entrepreneurs. And then at that point, I took my recipe and Fat was seeking a manufacturing partner to bring it to scale with. And are you still at uni or college at this time and doing this on the side? Or are you already at this point like, I'm going all in and I'm going to drop out of college? All in, yeah. I, when I began recipe testing in my kitchen, and it was very much still an idea in my head, I dropped out of college then. I felt just such a strong sense of conviction in my gut that this is what I was meant to be acting on and that it just didn't feel random at all, um, that I had this idea and just the impact that I felt it could have in so many people's lives. If we could successfully kick sugar out of candy, the most sugar packed aisle in the entire grocery store, then it makes a much larger statement about why is so much added sugar in our foods today. So yeah, I just felt like such a strong sense. And then when I would sit in my kind of logical brain, I'd go, you know what, if it fails, that's okay. But then I know for me, go all in at that point, I think I would have been in my rocking chair, 90 years old, and been living with like, what if I did? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you're looking for your manufacturer to like bring this to life. I imagine in the candy industry, the minimum orders are like hundreds of thousands, if not more. What does that early piece of the puzzle look like in terms of, you know, your personal investment into getting your first batch of product ready and kind of like leading you up to launch? Yeah. So yeah, you're totally right. The minimums with manufacturers are definitely higher than would actually make sense, both financially and just from a pure or as you have in, in the beginning. So for me, it was really finding a manufacturing partner who saw the vision. And that was really what I focused on. It wasn't that my orders are going to be your absolute minimum, or can we have the minimum to start with? It was, if you come on this journey with me now, this is what where the future of candy is going, and we will be your partner for you to be a leader in that future. And so really getting them behind the vision was so, so important because from a logical standpoint, it made zero sense for anyone to partner with us, both from a minimums and then also from a when you're running candy with no sugar on a machine that has only ran candy with sugar, it creates like so many issues operationally. So it was really just getting them behind the vision to take that leap of faith. When you say getting them behind the vision, do you mean like you, you know, had to pitch them with a deck just to like actually just get them to be excited? Or do you mean like, hey, let me give you equity in the business and kind of you're actually in the business? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, not from an equity standpoint, more from a helping paint the picture so that they understand five years from now that Smart Sweets is going to be a big player and low sugar candy is going to be a huge segment of the candy industry and it's going to uh, continue to grow larger and larger and larger and that this is really an opportunity for both of us but for them in, in that they will be the partner that has um, the manufacturing of the largest company that's creating this. So it was really getting them behind that and just, I didn't even use a deck. I just sat down with them face to face, showed them the product and just like really painted the visual picture. And although I was like terrified inside, just speaking with that sense of conviction, you know, people like get excited about that and and they want to be part of that. Wow, that's so cool. So cool. How old were you at this point, by the way? You're in your early 20s. 
when you first started? Yeah, yeah, I was 21 at that point. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. So amazing. And so something that I love to talk about before we get into kind of the launch and those early, the early kind of year and hustle is the money piece of the puzzle. How much of your like personal kind of savings did you need to invest to get that first order up and running? And how were you thinking about capital? Obviously in CPG and in something like this where the minimums are really high, you need to have a lot of working capital and it needs to be something that you're already thinking about. So I'm interested to hear kind of what you had in your mind at the very beginning. Totally. I really didn't have much savings at all. I had a beat up Honda Fit hatchback and that was that was what I owned in the world. And so I was able to secure 105,000 debt financing and that supported me through getting the product on the shelf. I tried to be really really intentional about being as capital efficient as possible and so uh, and so I really looked at okay what is the what is what is like the smallest amount that I need add a buffer onto that um, but really didn't want to give equity away when I knew that what that would mean for me right now valuation wise versus when I scaled the company would be just so so radically different and it was always important to me to be the majority owner of the company to have the autonomy and in decisions and that sort of thing. And so when you kind of, as you progressed, were you, I wasn't able to see online whether you had specifically raised capital through VC or whether it was just through, you know, other forms of financing. Yeah. So I, I, in the beginning, first did the 105k debt financing. And then there was a period of time between raising that, that I wouldn't be able to access more debt financing. Um, until we grew a little bit, I didn't have any other personal items or anything to put a security other than um, my own life, which I already had through life insurance. I read that. That's so random. Is that standard practice, by the way? I, I have no idea. I just remember standing there and they were asking, like, I had to go through a, a screening call and they were asking all of these questions like, have your toes ever had a disease? Has your anyone in your family ever had major chronic illness? Like all these things where I was like, oh my God, like this, this is really intense. But yeah, so to kind of bridge the gap between being able to access more debt financing, I raised on a convertible note. And so delayed still putting off the valuation, but was able to get that in between capital. And then I once we raised that, we were at a point in growth where debt financing would be a feasible option again. And so we really scaled the company uh, for the next couple of years with that. And then I had met someone who was just an amazing um, individual that had built and scaled a business very similar to Smart Suites. And I really wanted him involved in the business as well as at the that same timing, we uh, really, really wanted to kind of pour fuel on the fire from a marketing standpoint that we weren't able to do with debt financing, which we were able to use primarily for inventory and, and more operational things like that. So we raised three million total from him. And that was it. And then we just continued scaling with debt financing. Holy shit. So you, I read that it's reported that you sold the business for 360 million and you only raised like 3 million to get to that. That's like insane. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think there's such a kind of stigma or like idolizing thing around raising where it's like, oh, you raised from uh, this person or this person or this amount of money and that becomes the celebration and then you get PR and it's just but I feel like that just distracts from the fact that actually that money is so that you can grow your business and those milestones are the ones to celebrate and if you can raise no money or as little money as possible amazing because in the end that's so much more beneficial for 
everyone, your team, everyone on our squad at that point had equity. It's every beneficial for your team for you just ends up benefiting you in so many ways. And yeah, we partnered with TPG in a majority partnership. They've been an amazing partner, um, but we're still very much on the journey. It feels like in some ways that it's still it's still day one and we're just getting started, which is exciting. That's so cool. I feel like I've jumped a bit ahead. So I want to go back to around the launch and what was kind of like happening for you at this time where you've just placed this massive order, you're kind of just getting started. How are you getting the word out there and getting people to try your product and kind of starting to get, you know, your first thousand customers, for example. I had read a book uh, by Tim Ferriss. Actually, I think it was his blog on the book. And he was talking about his very first book, The 4-Hour Work Week. And when he was writing that, how he was deciding how to market it and that he was thinking, oh, this book could be applicable for everyone. But then he was like, okay, what niche can I really focus on? So all of a sudden this book feels like it's everywhere. And so that was really inspiring to me. And what the hypothesis I took for smart suites was, okay, what niches can we really dive into where it's going to be creating radical value for them in their lives? They couldn't have candy before or for a very long time. Um, and it's going to feel like smart suites is everywhere. So I, I chose the Weight Watchers community and the, the fitness community. And within like a month in those communities online and social media, they felt like Smart Suites was this big company when really we barely existed in the world. And so that was just so, so powerful. And that's really how we began building our like radical radically passionate community that we call our friends. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. Can we break this down a little bit more? When you say you targeted kind of Weight Watchers in the fitness community, what do you specifically mean? Like, are you sending emails to people who work at Weight Watchers to try and get in with the community or what does that look like? Yeah, so it was primarily social media. So I was, it was really a scrappy so scrappy fun and fruity but I would be on my phone like 10 hours a day and just finding the key influencers not they didn't even necessarily have to have large followings just the people in that space who really had a voice in their community and who I felt the product would really authentically um, make a positive impact in their lives and so I just started dming um, and, and just like connecting, just offering, hey, I this is Smart Suites. I'd love to send some for you to try. And also just taking the time to like comment on something really authentic about their journey, not just a standard copy and paste. And that went so, 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 so far. We didn't have any budget to pay anyone to post. The product was was the gift. And Like I'd say 90% of people that were sent product became then radical fans in our, in our community and our, our friends and began posting about it organically. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. And I love how you put focus on, you know, authentically commenting and authentically engaging to build that, you know, true relationship versus like just trying to slap it everywhere kind of thing. That's definitely what people should be focusing on, especially in today's world where it's so saturated in every industry. Totally. Yeah. 100%. It's like, yeah, you could copy and paste out a hundred messages instead of 15 or 20 in the same period of time. But if you're not building that authentic connection and people can can get that vibe from a mile away, then it's not going to go far. Cool. So That's like kind of the beginning of your story. And I know at some point you get on Shark Tank. Tell us about that experience and what that moment kind of did for you and the brand. Yeah. So for us, I'd I'd say throughout Smart Suites' entire journey, when I started Smart Suites, I always thought, you know, there's going to be this milestone and this milestone, and that will be our silver bullet to to hockey stick growth and all these things. And what I came to realize along the journey was 
there's like not one event that is the silver bullet to success. It's just the accumulation that kind of keeps that momentum going of like the snowball getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but you still have to push the snowball. And I feel like in startup life, it's always up a hill that you think it's going to come roll down and kill you. <laughs> yeah. So with Shark Tank, our version of that in Canada is called Dragon's Den. Oh, sorry. Dragon's Den. I get them all. I get them confused. Dragon's Den. Yes. Yeah. There's a bunch of names for different ones. So that experience was just very serendipitous. Um, a producer reached out and said, Hey, I, I tried Smart Suites. Would you be interested in pitching the, the Dragons? And then two weeks later, I flew out to Toronto um, and filmed it. I honestly blacked out just from the adrenaline. I thought I was in there for like two minutes. And they said, no, you, you've been in there for an hour or over an hour. And I was like, wow, I, 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 I can't remember anything that I've said. So I hope that. I hope that I just, it all flowed well together. Yeah, it was a really great experience and scary as well um, and exciting and all the things. But I think just leaning into those opportunities that arise and saying yes is so powerful and goes a long way. And And we've gotten so much brand awareness, particularly in Canada, from the show and continued from the show now because it's on Netflix. That's so cool. Where were you in terms of the journey when the Dragon's Den experience happened? Yeah, it was pretty early on. So at that point, I believe we were in just over 400 stores. It was our first year. And when I was on the show, I had said that I thought we were going to do over a million in the first year and we ended up doing 2.2. So it was very early on in our journey. And I think similar with the manufacturing, but not a lot of the conversation on Dragon's Den, I think that led to it just being a really um, productive and, and positive time on the show was the vision and just getting the picture painted for them of where we are today, but what this is going to be. And it's so crazy, like going on a show like this, you obviously get that national coverage and the PR kind of on the back end that just keeps on keeps on giving, I guess. If you had to distill, you know, from then until say 2020, I read that, you know, oh, you say you were in 400 and something stores and you did 2.2 million in that first year. And then I read by 2020, you're in like 38,000 stores. You'd done like a hundred million dollars in revenue. What are the kind of key pivotal things that happened in that time to get you from two to a (laughs) hundred? So many things. I think at the very like top of the funnel, really being clear on what your vision is and and not just your vision in the sense of like, okay, this is what I hope for that we're going to be someday, but attaching a timeline to it, even if that timeline doesn't end up being your timeline, just being like, for me, for example, I was like, okay, I want Smart Tweets to be the global leader in revolutionizing candy. And so maybe that goal is the 10 year from starting in my kitchen recipe testing goal and then I was like okay well that means that we have to be the leader first in Canada and the USA and and then I was like okay and this doesn't exist today but I really believe that the sense of urgency and speed on this needs to be quite intense because this is going to exist and so also thinking with the mindset always that there are 10 other people working on this to really keep that sense of urgency um, and then just peeling that back. So I was like, okay, so we need to scale rapidly across USA and Canada um, from a product standpoint, but also just from a brand awareness and distribution standpoint. And so that really informed the more micro decisions. Um, One of them that played a huge role in that was deciding to go national in each country from the launch there. So a lot of food companies start a regional, kind of build in your own backyard, build a brand presence there, expand. And my hypothesis was, you know, with social media these days that one, you can create that broad awareness to get that push that you need into the store. 
And secondly, that it could actually frustrate and alienate people if you're not available nationally because they'll see you on social media and be like, oh, I can only get you in this province. I don't live there. So that was a really key decision or an example of a decision that ended up really serving us a rapid expansion we were able to do. But it really just tied back to continuing to reverse execute from that end vision and um, and then being like, okay, what does that mean for me right now? And what decisions do I have to make? While you're like kind of touching on social media, I'd love to understand how you were approaching in general your marketing and your social media and the way that you were reaching your customers, especially in that early kind of first year or two. Yeah. So we were, we were so scrappy. We really didn't put any money towards social media ads or, or things like that really in a meaningful way until year year three. So it really for us was just that head down, um, being on, on the phone, finding these people, creating the spreadsheets of, of our influencers. And um, that really was such a huge way. And then to scale our, our awareness and just our brand strength on social, we did a lot of partnerships with other brands in the space giveaways, things like that. We partnered with our retailers where traditionally they would be wanting to like charge us to be in their e-newsletter. So we would go to them and say, hey, like what if we actually put you on our social media and like really shouted you from the rooftop. So do some marketing for you and um, and many of them would waive fees and things like that. There wasn't really anything complicated about how we scaled our brand awareness. And then also from a PR perspective, we would find articles and message the editors. When I say we in that um, in that really first year it was myself and our first squad member, Beth, who is still with on the squad and, and with Smart Suites today. And so it was also came down to just how many hours there are in a day with two of us. She like took on so much of that um, and, and just having that manpower, woman power between the both of us was also really, really critical because I could not have done that alone, both from a just sheer number of hours there are in a day. And then also she was such an Einstein in her ideas and she had an amazing graphic designing background and so she was creating all of our content and just brought so much to the table that weren't my strengths and so we worked really well together so I would say also finding finding someone if with the asterisks of if you can of course from a um, from a financial perspective that will really get in the trenches with you. I love that. Shout out to Beth. (laughs) I think as well, like what I take from that is a lot of people seem to, you know, complicate things or think that there's some, you know, magic bullet with doing all these fancy things and hiring all these external agencies and things like that. And it's like, if you just take it back to the basics and in the beginning, you just invest your time in like doing it consistently every single day showing up messaging as many people as you can getting as much product in the hands of people as you can slowly that will start to build attraction and that's what pays off in the big picture 100 percent, yeah i thought the same thing as well like surely there's you know when we get this pr when we get this or this and those are all amazing things and some of them really kind of put the accelerate button on 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 things but 100% 100% there's there's no secret formula or things like that it really comes down to just putting your head down and just being consistent and what I found really helpful especially in the early days was to keep a spreadsheet of the small wins because in the day-to-day it is so hard you're in it sometimes you don't see any progress in the day-to-day and it can be so tough mentally as well to have that grip to just keep going and going and going. And so keeping a spreadsheet of the small wins, even if it was something like XYZ retailer didn't email me back, but I saw that they opened my email and celebrating that as a win. It doesn't have to be huge, but for me, I found so much motivation in that to just keep going when it just feels like you're 
grinding and grinding and grinding, um, but haven't had any of those larger milestones that you're hoping for yet. Yeah, I love that. And I'm actually just feeling like I'm going to take that as inspiration and literally stick a sticky note on my computer, like under my computer and write my little wins so that I'm constantly looking at them. And then at the end of like the week or the month, you look back and be like, oh, wow, I actually do have some great things, especially if you're having a low day. I'm I'm taking that. I'm going to do that. (laughs) That starts today. (laughs) I love that for you. Thank you. I love that for me too. Now that you've kind of partnered with this company and they have a majority stake in the business, what does your role look like and your day-to-day now? And how does that change your approach to building the business? Yeah, absolutely. So, So for me, I always felt like since day one, I always felt clarity that at some point in the business, it's going to make sense to partner with someone who can really equip us with the resources to accelerate the mission in a much deeper way than we would have been able to do without without that kind of partner. For me, it was always a matter of when. And for me, I wanted to scale the company first and then bring on that partner versus raising from VC or PE super early on and, and that sort of thing. Um, so in finding a partner, what was really important to me was finding someone who a thousand percent gets the vision. It's more like this partner is joining us on the mission and accelerating it, not that they're joining us and changing the mission in a way that it doesn't feel like the same one from day one. And so TBG has been such an incredible partner and they've done exactly that. So they've equipped us with the resources and just the different things that when when the company is going to its next phase in growth that we definitely wouldn't have needed in the early days, but now they started to, the, those things were starting to slow us down. So kind of bringing the systems and the maturity and the next level talent and all of these things so that we can really execute at a much more efficient pace and quicker than we ever have been able to before. And that's what I find most exciting. I think now about the company is like in the early days, we would kick 1 billion grams of sugar in like two years. And now it's like we can kick 1 billion grams of sugar in one quarter. And that's only getting faster and faster and faster in large part because of the TPG partnership and what they're equipping us with to be able to execute on. So my role as well has has shifted and and kind of throughout the entire Smart Suites journey, one thing that I always tried to ask myself was to pause and be like, okay, where do I best serve at this part in the journey? And where am I perhaps holding us up? And what do I just plain suck at that it doesn't make sense for me to be doing anymore um and so in the beginning you know it's all the things doing the boxes doing the labeling and then as as you grow it it shifts and and for example um finance i didn't even know there was a sum function on excel when i was doing my spreadsheets for my debt financing so we brought on someone to lead our finance much earlier than most companies would because that was a weakness of mine but it was so incredibly important. So um, yeah, with the TBG partnership, I've really been able to now like fully lean in and having a, and also having an incredible new CEO lead our, lead our squad, really been able to lead into product. So just supporting the overall strategy and um, being on the board and having those strategic conversations now Whereas when I was the CEO, I was always very much in the day-to-day execution. And at the stage of growth we were at, I knew with clarity and sitting and asking myself, okay, where do I best serve? Where am I holding us up? That whether we brought on a partner or not, it would have been the right time for a new CEO. Um, And just having no ego about what's coming up for you when you're asking yourself that question, because it's about the mission at the end of the day and where everyone on the squad, including myself, is just a 
conduit, a very necessary conduit to achieving that mission and the impact for people in the world. Yeah, I love that. I love that so much. And it reminds me a lot of what Ben Francis did with a company called Gymshark, which is based out of the UK. I'm sure you know it. But he also removed himself from that CEO position. He's actually back as the CEO now, but he took himself out for a number of years, let someone else kind of run the business so he could focus on what he did best with brand and marketing. And I just think it's like, if that's like the way that founders want to go down that pathway, it's like, absolutely, you should lean into that and just do the things that you love and not like force yourself through the things that you don't love. (laughs) Yeah, 1000%. And it's also for sure, like a luxury to be able to get to the point of growth to do that. In the beginning, for sure, it's like you have no choice, you're packing the boxes, you're doing all the things, but totally like, when you can at those small bits begin delegating what you suck at. (laughs) 100%. Is there anything that you wish someone told you when you were starting out that you can pass on to an early stage entrepreneur? I think one thing that really stuck with me throughout the journey that I was just continually surprised about. In the beginning, I always thought that like when you get to this certain point of growth or achieve x number of sugar kicked or retailers or uh, dollars in revenue so you just kind of have this like unwavering confidence that you just kind of like know what you're doing you figured it out and you just and for me throughout smart Three's entire journey i had like massive imposter syndrome in the beginning first because i was just so like every single day having to like really reaffirm for myself, I can do this, I can do this, I'm capable, I'm capable, like reading different book pages, listening to um, podcasts, like those motivational soundtracks that are the cheesy ones, just really anything to just cling on to, not getting uh, stuck in the paralysis of fear. And as I scaled, I always thought, okay, that will, that will go away. But for me, it, it became way more intense in different ways than we had this team and I was like, wow, we have this team of 40 people who are have chosen Smart Suite's mission to entrust their time, talent, and energies to, and I'm I'm uh, entrusting me to to guide us in the right way. And every time I would hop on a team meeting at right before going on Zoom or when we were in person in person, I just would have the biggest imposter syndrome of being like, what do I say? I don't know. Are they, like These people are all so incredible and talented. Like, if, uh, What could I possibly say that would um, inspire or be of help to them? So that was really an interesting learning for me that, oh, this is actually normal and nobody knows what they're doing at any stage. We're all just figuring it out as we go. Wow, that's amazing. Gosh, crazy that so many people do have these feelings and suffer from the doubts and the inner kind of dialogue, the the negative inner dialogue, even when you're at the level that you are. Um, It's really crazy. (laughs) Yeah, it's Yeah, totally. It really is. What's your number one top piece of advice for entrepreneurs who are entering the candy space specifically? I think the candy space specifically, I think having a radical value proposition, I think is one of the reasons at the heart as to why um, Smart Suites scaled so quickly and why we're continuing to, to grow and be the market leader and then next a global leader. And it was inspired by Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One, that the concept that to have a massively successful product and company and then simultaneously impact in the world, you can't just take something that exists and make it a little better. You have to take something that exists and make it create so much radical value that for people, it's kind of reinventing the wheel, but in a really meaningful way that sparks the passion and enthusiasm and just the emotional response from someone to your product. And so I would say that above all is make sure your product has that radical value proposition. I love that. Everyone listening, take your notes, radical value prop. (laughs) We need it. (laughs) 
<laughs> this has been so cool, Tara. Thank you so much for sharing all of this amazing journey with us. We usually wrap up the end of every episode with a series of six quick questions, some of which we might have covered, some of which we might not have, but I ask them all the same. So question number one is, what's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing every day? My why in the beginning was my Oma and the conversation I had with her. And it very quickly became, I think, feeling like and really realizing that everyone in their life at some point has struggled with eating something they love and feeling bad about it. Woman in particular with body image and self-esteem and, and just seeing the impact that Smart Sweets is having on people's lives. That was so powerful to me where like someone would go to the candy aisle and be like, I cried. And now we get invitations to weddings. And so that very quickly became the why that there is everyone this is a universal feeling and it's so much more than enjoying candy it's giving people back that joy that they had when they were a kid enjoying something so special to them and really empowering them in their lives that they can have the foods they love and feel good about it and then that snowballs to feeling confident and the making the decisions day to day that make you feel like you're living your best life so yeah, that's that's the why now and still my own life, of course. That's so cool. Very special. Question number two is what's been your favorite marketing moment so far? My favorite ones are kind of ironically the funny ones or sometimes the ones that don't go as planned. And in the early days, like we would just come up with a hypothesis. If you have an idea, it's a hypothesis. Let's test it in a small way. If it lands, great. Play it bigger. If it doesn't land, then we take the golden nuggets and learnings and move on. So we did this campaign because our product is high in fiber, um, but it's really easy on your tummy and digestive. And typically traditional um, sugar-free candy uses loads of sugar alcohol that causes digestive upset. So we launched this campaign, which we thought was genius at the time, called We Shit You Not. And we sent like shit emoji pillows to all of our influencers and, and retail partners, like literally posters with a shit emoji next to um, the bag of smart sweets, which didn't really make a whole lot of sense in terms of like what you want to be associated with. But at the time, Beth and I thought this campaign was just like the like next level of genius. Idea. <laughs> what was the feedback? <laughs> Most retailers didn't take it because I make sense. Like it's a shit emoji next to like the food product, even though we were saying this will not make you shit. And <laughs> but some consumers, I think they thought it was funny. We thought it would go like viral and all these things, and it, it didn't. But it gave us a good memory, <laughs> a good story for sure. Question number three is: What's your go-to business resource? You've already shared so many good ones, but if you had to kind of pick a book, a podcast, or a newsletter that you're tuning into oh yeah that's a good one hmm. you know I think in the beginning one book that was hugely hugely impactful to me and I would literally rip out pages and just um I, I still have them like highlighted and now like framed just because this had such deep impact on me the book's name is so cheesy and like I don't like it, but the content's amazing. It's called How to Get Rich by Felix Dennis. And it's just so powerful because it really just breaks down for you that it's not this far success and the impact that you want to create in the world is not a far-fetched idea that is really within your arm's reach if you just have the determination, the grit, and um, the persistence and all these things. And so I clung to those words when I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing and just feeling terrified. I love that. We're going to link it in the show notes for anyone who wants to check it out. I'm going to add it to my reading list as well. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM and PM rituals or habits that keep you feeling happy and successful and motivated? Yeah, it's changed a lot since the beginning of Smart Suites. I think mindfulness in general is now much larger part of my day. Um, however, one thing since 
the beginning that uh, was always served me so well in the morning, but especially at night. I would just sit there and lie at night and just stare at the roof and just reflect on what I was grateful for that day and like how lucky I felt to have the gift from the universe or God or whatever it is you believe in to be on this journey. I just like could not believe it that like, wow, like this is actually my life. I actually get to build this candy company and, and just having the gratitude for that always brought me back to like in the hardest and like darkest of days, just being like, you know what I have like being in gratitude and then, putting it out to the world and saying, you know, I've done everything I possibly could have done today. And now it's, it's the universe has a larger plan and that there's always, everything's happening for you, not to you. I found to be so powerful and to always think everything's a a opportunity hidden in disguise. And it, it always, always has been. So yeah, bringing yourself back to gratitude I found so hugely helpful. I love that. So true. So true. Question number five is what's been your worst money mistake and how much did you lose? Hmm, That's a good question. The worst mistake I would say, which again, I don't, I, in hindsight, I'm like, it's not really a mistake and there being an opportunity hidden in disguise. We got some really great people involved in smart suites through it, but when I was launching the first manufacturing run, everyone would say to me, you know, make sure that your projections aren't outlandish. Like, make sure that they're realistic. Make sure that they're realistic. So I made sure that I thought they were realistic and they ended up swinging way too low. And so then I was in this position a month after launching being like, shit, I don't have capital to do another run that's larger I can't access more debt financing and so um the convertible note we did was really because I took too small amount of debt financing so I would say yes have realistic projections but the thing that you also have to have is like what if things go really really well and make sure you're planning for that scenario as well great piece of advice love that Very cool. Thank you. And question number six, last question. What is just a crazy story you can share from the journey of building this business, good, bad, or otherwise? Yeah. Oh gosh. So many. That's the magical thing about startup life. I feel like it's so crazy. It's truly a roller coaster. One hour you're like, woohoo. And the next hour you're like in the depths of despair. Um, (laughs) But I feel like, yeah, the serendipitous moments and just the crazy things where you're like, how is this even real life right now? Make it so fun. One thing that was like pretty serendipitous and just crazy was that we were still very small in Canada only, I think less than 100 stores. A um, producer from Fox Business reached out and was like, we would love to do a feature on you and Smart Suites. Can you come to New York and film the segment next week? And that was like needle in a haystack because we did not exist in the world. I was just in complete shock, but again, leaning in and saying yes to opportunities when they present themselves. So we were like, yeah, of course. Went to um, there the next week, filmed the segment, and like 10 minutes later, I got an email from the global confectionery buyer at Whole Foods saying we would like to discuss a global launch. And from that email, at first I thought it was spam or junk mail or something because Whole Foods like doesn't just come and knock on your doorstep and offer a global launch. You know, you have to go find the buyer, grind, like do regional, all these things. And that led to our nationwide USA launch less than a year later at Whole Foods. Um, And the buyer, I came to find out, he doesn't even watch Fox. He actually hates Fox. He was just scrolling through the channels and it just happened to be on. So that's one of those moments of just like, it's too crazy to be random. And it felt like just a nudge from the universe being like, just keep going. And that was consistent the whole journey. Whenever things just felt like 
really, really hard and how are we going to possibly solve this, there would always be a nudge from the universe in small ways or big like this one where it would just be like, we got you, like, keep going, keep going and just kind of helps to shepherd us along. And I really believe that, you know, it speaks to the testament of just having a really good product that people can instantly be like, I recognize what this is. I'm on board. We see the mission and you have a great product. So we love it. And, you know, these things, of course, come from that. You have to have a good product. (laughs) A thousand percent. Yeah. Tara, this was so cool. Thank you so much for coming on Female Startup Club and sharing your journey. I am in awe of what you're doing and I can't wait to continue to watch you crush it. Ditto. Congrats again on your adventure and what you're creating in the world and the amazing impact that you're having in all of the listeners' lives. So yeah, thanks for having me on it.